Uh, as you can see, I am not alone this morning. And that just makes me happy. I like to have uh, good company. And uh, Pastor Chambers is more than just good company. But we're going to wait for all of these systems to load up. There are a couple that are still receiving the data. So in just about two minutes, we're going to begin with prayer. Uh, in the meantime, I want you to go ahead and click the share button on whichever platform you are watching and let people know that we are in the house with the word of God, even though uh, some of us can't come out the house. Yeah, we're thankful. So pastor, I am going to find this feed <laughs> and uh, begin to share. And uh, when you're ready, you can share too. Let me get this out. I hope everyone is doing well. If you are, go ahead and type in the feed. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I've been checking on people uh, to make sure that they're doing fine because we can't take anything for granted these days. I'm going to YouTube and get the link so I can push it out to different groups. And uh, you all should be free to do the same. Uh, how you doing over there, Pastor Chambers? People want to know. Yes, I'm good. Good. Um, observing a few people on my my end. Okay, very good, very good. Very have good. A to those who are joining at this time. Very good. All right. And so I see it on. Oops. Can you imagine? Uh, well, listen. Some of these did not take the actual description I put out. So I apologize to those who have a strange description, but uh, that's the best we can do today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it's put out the wrong description. I'm going to need to fix that at the appropriate time, Pastor Chambers. So pardon me. Uh, that is the strangest thing. I've never seen that happen. So welcome to everyone on Facebook. Welcome to everyone on YouTube, and I hope that you are doing well. In uh, one more minute, we're going to go ahead and begin uh, with prayer uh, because the description is not correct. I don't know why. I don't know why. So, yes. Sabbath. Guys, welcome. All right, let's see. We have some comments already. Happy Sabbath. Sister Barnaby, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. I am glad that you are here. I'm going to edit this post and make sure that the right uh, description is out, just like the one that Pastor Chambers put out. And we will begin with prayer. Thank you for bearing with me here. Thank you for bearing with me. Yes. Okay. So it's a blessing to be alive, especially considering all that the world is going through at the same time. I don't know if you've, if you all have ever thought of it in this way, uh, considering that the world is having the same crisis everywhere in the world. And, and, you know, God is so good to us because uh, if, if, it was left up to us, we would be in a problem. Yes, and sir. it looks like the Central Jamaica Conference page did not take the feed yet. So I'm waiting for that one to load up past the pastor chambers. Okay. All right. So the central page has it. And uh, now I'm fixing the description. Yeah. If it was left up to us, we would be in a problem we could not get out of. But I'm thankful that it was not left up to us. It was all about God. And his. Uh, it is, see, uh, is that you? Now. Is that you, sir, or me? Me. That, that's okay. me. That central conference page is loaded now. Okay. Good. Good. So now I can uh, send the link out. Uh, but everybody, yes, if it was left up to us, we would be in such a problem that we could not get out of. But because God is good to us and nothing catches him off guard, uh, we have the blessing of God's counsel, his wisdom, his tender watch care, uh, and all of his plans. And something came to me, sir, that God has us in a position now where we have to build with our families. We have to build a closer knit community where we may have uh, spread out somehow and lost touch. And where you know, it's, it's a blessing that we can, we can now 
uh, learn together as he gets us through our trials. So let's go ahead and pray and we can get underway. I have shared where I'm going to share. Would you pray for us, sir, please? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are about to study your words. Let your Holy Spirit be our guide. Be with each person who have joined us at this time. Be with Ella Harris and myself and grant that together, Lord, we will gain understanding that will help to increase our faith in you. Mm -hmm. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I would like to welcome you, uh, those of you who are joining on Facebook, on YouTube and various other platforms. I'd like to welcome you to the Central Jamaica Conference of Seventh-day Adventists Sabbath School. And it's a wonderful opportunity for my friend and predecessor and ministry partner, Pastor Chambers. We've done things like this before, uh, but I'm glad that we can do so today. And uh, so we are going to run together on this program because you can never have too many people when it comes to wisdom that God will give from the word of God. So thank you, Pastor Chambers, for uh, the blessing of running together with you. And uh, so we're going to uh, lesson number 12 in the adult Sabbath school lesson for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, before we get into the subject matter, which is largely from, and I say largely, from the book of Daniel chapter 11, uh, I just wanted to give a thought. Um, there is a lot of information and inspiration in the scriptures. Uh, in Bible prophecy, especially last day's Bible prophecy, sometimes we teachers or preachers or evangelists may get caught into the information part, which is critical, and miss the inspiration. So we are going to have a balance today. And if I were to put on my preacher's hat just for a moment, the first thing that would come to my mind regarding Daniel 11 is Daniel 12. And what do I mean? In the beginning of Daniel chapter 12, the first verse, and I'm sure we'll look at it again, it shows that at a particular time, Michael, or Michael, uh, we'll just run right to it to say that Michael is Jesus Christ. Michael, uh, whose name means who is what, who is what God is, or who is as God is, uh, he stands up. But the thing about it is, through Daniel chapter 2, multiple places through the book, and then in Daniel chapter 11, we see all kinds of kings, powers, alliances, relationships, religious, political powers standing up mm -hmm. with a, a particular end, which we would have seen forecast in Daniel chapter 2, where God said he's going to basically decimate all of hu human ingenuity and finally establishes kingdom in the universe where there's no more human uh, deliberation and alliances, right? So we stand up, Babylon stands up, it falls down. Medo-Persia, it falls up, it, it sits down. Grecia, the Western Roman Empire, the divisions of Rome, papal Rome, and a lot of alliances and other powers in between. All of them have stood most of them have fallen. All of them soon will fall and sit down for Jesus Christ to stand up, preacher. And when he stands up, the next time he sits down, it's going to be on his throne of glory. Jesus Christ will come as the king of glory and there will be no more earthly empires. And so I'm thankful that we can look now at some of the details from Daniel chapter 11. And uh, we can go ahead and begin there, sir. So what Ella Harris did was to give you the crooks of the matter. In other words, if you miss anything, don't miss that. Mm -hmm. Don't get bogged down in the details and then um, forget to know that in the end, Christ Michael will stand up on behalf yes. of his people. Yes. And it's, it's not a waste of words when it says stand up on behalf of his people mm. because that statement speaks to the focus of Daniel chapter 11. And if you'll pardon me, um, Ella Harris, I'm going to be sharing my screen at this time. Okay, sir. Um, just to give up so we can understand what the focus of Daniel chapter 11 is. Daniel chapter 10 is the introduction to Daniel chapter 11. Mm -hmm. And the angel told Daniel what Daniel chapter 11 and 12, I'm, I'm putting all three chapters in, in one. 
is, is all about. Verse 14 says, I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. So the idea is that this apocalyptic vision, the fourth one in the book of Daniel, focuses on God's people because each of the um, chapters in each of the vision in Daniel, four of them have a different focus as I mentioned earlier. In Daniel chapter two, the focus was on the kingdom. Remember that Daniel and his people were in captivity. They had their own kingdom, which is God's kingdom, but it was handed over to the Babylonians. And so the concern was what was going to happen to their kingdom, what was going to happen to their people, what was going to happen to their sanctuary and their city. And so each of these vi apocalyptic vision focus on a different aspect. As I said, the first one focused on the kingdom. And in the end, um, God's kingdom represented by a mountain will reign. The second vision in Daniel chapter 7 focused on the king. Um, and eventually, Jesus, our king, will be our judge and eventually um, give judgment in favor of the saints. Daniel chapter 8 and 9 focus on the sanctuary. That in the end, though the sanctuary will be desecrated, it will be restored and the sanctuary will be cleansed. God's salvation program will come to an end and, and fulfill his purpose. And finally, the one that we are on, focus on God's people and the struggles that they will have. And as Ella Harris says, in the end, Michael will stand up for God's people. Now, before I bring in Ella Harris, one thing we need to note about Daniel chapter 11, as we mentioned earlier, that not many, many Bible scholars, not many preachers talk about Daniel 11. And the reality is it's a difficult um, chapter to understand. It's not easy to understand. And so what we're going to be trying to do is to give you an overall picture of it. So to give you some keys for unlocking um, Daniel chapter 11, we're going to be giving you some details, but the most important thing are the keys that will help you to unlock Daniel chapter 11. I'm not sure if you want to go ahead, Ella Harris, and give your perspective on some best approaches for understanding Daniel chapter 11. Well, uh, Daniel 11, like all last days oriented Bible prophecy, if you want to say it's not all in the last days, but last days oriented is it, God gives us a principle in Isaiah chapter 28 verses 9 and 10 that basically says that we are to compare scripture with scripture. And as we can say for the entire book of Daniel, the entire book of Revelation, there are times that there are obvious symbols. There are obvious symbols. If you see a beast with a bunch of wings and teeth and horns and stuff, you've not seen that in nature. So you can reasonably expect that there, there is a symbol employed. And if there's a symbol, then, of course, there's going to be an explanation of the symbol. Uh, in terms of Daniel chapter 11, as uh, Pastor, you have already said, uh, I actually want to defer to the lesson. They made a, a good point on Sabbath's lesson, uh, Sabbath, March 14, that, that Daniel chapter 11 follows three basic points. First, it begins with the Persian kings and discusses their fates at the time of the end when the king of the north attacks the holy mountain of God. So we'll have to talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> Second, a succession of battles between the king of the north and that of the king of the south and how they affect God's people is described. And I want to come back to that in just a moment uh, and uh, how that's described. Third, it concludes with a happy ending as the king of the north faces his demise by the glorious holy mountain. Such a positive conclusion signals the end of evil and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. So I want to give a, another baseline since, Pastor, you've already looked at the chapters 2, uh, 7, 8, 10, and then 11 and 12. I want to talk about, so Daniel chapter 2 shows a succession of earthly kingdoms. Majority of them I outlined clearly in the scriptures by name, and then based on God's track record of predicting those and giving us understanding and symbols, we knew what the fourth major power would be and then subsequent powers, right? Uh, but at the end of all of that, we see 
the stone cut out of the mountain without hands representing God's kingdom coming and, like I said earlier, decimating earthly kingdoms. But after Daniel 2 sort of closes with that, God starts to break down what happens between the final earthly kingdom, if you want to say in quotes, and that stone, God's kingdom coming. Enter judgment. Enter a lot of other details about sort of the machinery of alliances and other kingdoms coming up. So the judgment that takes place is a three-phase judgment or three-fold judgment. And we see the picture of it really opening up in Daniel chapter 7, where uh, one like the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, appears before the Ancient of Days, God our Father, and he receives the kingdom and dominion and glory and power and so forth. And eventually, once that judgment or phase of judgment and then the rest of the phases are completed, then Jesus is able to restore dominion and glory and so forth to human beings who would have lost it because Adam failed in the Garden of Eden. So it's a full circle. He gave us dominion. We lost dominion. And then through all of this in Daniel, we can see where Jesus is able with the authority now as the one who's not just the son of God, which is critical, but he's the son of man who represented us and was successful in human life. So now he can restore the kingdom. But in the meantime, he has to deal with these powers who feel like they can flex, if you want to say, on God. And so that's where we are here. That's right. That's right. Um, just before we jump into the details, I want to clarify something because mm-hmm. when you are, when you're going to be seeking for information on Daniel chapter eleven, mm-hmm. most of the evangelical world will have a certain interpretation. Oh boy! Right, and they <laughs> yes, will present the, the the full interpretation to to end with Antiochus Epiphanes, and in a little while you understand what's the meaning behind that that funny name. Mm-hmm. Right? Antiochus Epiphanes was a Grecian king who ruled in the second century BC and he did desecrate the Jewish temple mm-hmm. and persecuted the Jews so they are interpreting him to be the little horn of Daniel 8 and the king of the um, north of Daniel 11 who, who created the abomination of desolation but there are, there are three reasons why Antiochus Epiphanes could not be the one to fulfill these um, <clears throat> things in Daniel chapter 11. Number one is that Daniel was told that the vision will be for many days. That means it will be long. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like the other apocalyptic vision, it will end with the resurrection. If you notice in Daniel chapter 12, we talk about the resurrection of the saints. So that's where we expect the vision to end, not with Antiochus Epiphanes. The th- second thing is that in while Jesus was on the earth, in Matthew 24, verse 15, he expected the abomination of desolation to be yet future. It oh, I see. Yes. It already happened mm-hmm. um, in Antiochus Epiphanes' days. And thirdly, <clears throat> Daniel was told that that portion of the vision referring to the abomination of desolation is closed up and sealed until the time of the end. And we are now living in the time of the end, so we're expecting it to happen in our time. So those are the um, some clarification I wanted to to give regarding the um, interpretation of Daniel chapter eleven in the popular theologian world. If you just open, and, if you just go on Google or go on any yeah. of those books and search, you might find that interpretation. And just before I get back to you, Ella, what some quick things for for understanding for best approach for understanding Daniel eleven. First of all, you will need to study Daniel eleven history along with the passage you'll have to be a student of history okay right for you to be able to get into all the details and understand them all right you'll have to understand the history of greece and empire and the history of the roman empire at least those two Mm -hmm. Uh, media persia i think is clearly outlined in the book of daniel Mm -hmm. right the second thing is as mentioned previously um prophecy the prophets will cover a long time so it goes to the time of the end. So you're expecting this prophecy to parallel, um, and this is point number four, to parallel the previous visions, all right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
the third thing about this prophecy is that you're not going to find beasts and images like in the previous prophecies and, and goat and he, he goat in the in Daniel right, 8. Right. What you will have is a long story of different incidents. Okay, okay? yes. So so for example, if if I was writing prophecy, let's say I was mm -hmm. prophesying about the United States, the history of the United States, and I say at that time mm. a black president will rule. Ah, uh, what time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're narrowing once, it there. Once, once I say that, yes. you will know, know exactly. You'll be able to identify it. Some mm -hmm. of the things in, in Daniel 11 are, are difficult to understand because we were not there and we were not, we were not, we were not a part of that culture. Okay, yes. But those guys back then would have easily picked up what this thing is meaning in terms of the details that are being given when the king of the south attack and, and when he had always daughter to get married and so on and so forth. It will be easy to pick up. And that's why I said you need to know history. Right. But um, don't be become anxious because you don't know history. Mm -hmm. What you need to know is that in Daniel 11, there are some clues or what I refer to as some landmarks that you can pick up to know where a kingdom shift. Because you already know that it's supposed to be Medo-Persia. Ba Babylon is not in the picture, by the way. Right. It's supposed to be Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Papal Rome. You already know that from Daniel chapter 8. So in Daniel chapter 11, there are some landmark events and, and incidents that you can use to, to, to know that this is transitioning from Rome to pa Papal Rome. And okay, so yes. That's a very important um, indicator. And so don't get bogged down by details that you don't understand. Right. Understand how the thing is done. And, and finally, um, you also need to understand a little about the geography of Palestine and the Mediterranean. Because when the Bible talks about the king of the north and king of the south, it's literally north and south for, for okay. the most part. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. um, the king of the south, for example, is Egypt. Uh -huh. The Ptolemies, because it is actually south of Jerusalem. Okay. And the king of the north represents Syria and the Seleucid kingdom because it's actually literally north of Jerusalem. Okay. All right. So that those are some basic stuff that I wanted to share for you to keep in mind and in terms of understanding Daniel chapter 11. Well, I'm glad that you already identified north and south. And I like the perspective, the concept of the perspective you gave, because what I have said throughout the week as I was sharing in this lesson is that context is key. Yes. So there are some things that are understood when you're inside of the context. So the yes. example you gave of at that time, this black president of the United States. Well, you can now narrow your focus. Right. And I like also where you gave Jerusalem as a pivot point, if you want to say south of this place. So. OK, so you've already talked about the, the Seleucid and I'm glad you said that word because I always me mess it up. Right. King of the North. Right. <laughs> and the Ptolemies of Egypt South. Uh, the lesson writer points out, again, we can ask the question of why the Lord reveals ahead of time all of these details. Now, Pastor, uh, one thing that I love about prophecy is not just the facts and figures, which I do love, by the way. But there are times that people will ask us, how do you know the Bible is true? Mm -hmm. And of course, we, we could give them a bunch of answers. I'm talking about you and I, because I know you. A lot of answers. And we could talk nonstop. But one of the, the answers that I love is the, the, the solid foundation of, of, of last day's Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. Because God said ahead of time, a host of things that would happen, how they would happen, when they would happen, by whom they would happen, the impact of what happened. But then there's a strategic one that he just drops in on us that we seldom talk about. Mm -hmm. He talks about one that absolutely won't happen. And that is Babylon being rebuilt and people have thrown all yes. kinds of money at it. Yes, yes, yes. And so for me, I'm able and, to and, and you being go united. Ahead. And Europe yes. being united. Yes, one. Mm -hmm. Hashtag Brexit. Yes. 
pause. Yeah. So anyway, so we know that these things are are established by ancient and sometimes a little more recent history by details God would have given ahead of the time in the scriptures. And of course, there are some, if you want to try to tempt God, I would not suggest it, recommend it. You can throw your money at trying to unite Europe and trying to rebuild Babylon. Let us know how that works for you. And so, especially in a chapter like Daniel 11, we can see that God's God's love for details in giving us ahead of the time, like Jesus said in in John chapter, I forgot now, I think it's chapter uh, uh, five, Mm -hmm. uh, that we can know ahead of the time based on what he says and then decide whether we will believe that God sent him or no. So in this case, we answer the reason is simple. These wars affect God's people. So not only does he want us to have a firm uh, foundation to know the scriptures are true, but where do we come in all of this? The people who love God, who love love and God it's almost like, and I may be a little bit too excited, and, and pardon me if I say it wrong, Pastor, you'll help me with this. It's almost like God is vindicating his own character and at the same time aligning us with him to where he can vindicate his character through us as well. Because mm-hmm. the devil would have made it seem like, Pastor, that human beings cannot do what he says. Right, what God says, yes. It's impossible, it, it completely impossible. But God uh, is showing us here, when you look at the movements of bad mind people and people who would have been victimized, but then God would have exonerated and elevated them to say, but no, God is more than able to keep us from falling. Mm-hmm. He's more than able to even restore people who would have turned away from him. Yes. And we can see all of that outlined here. Yes, yes. So God, God as you as said, is preparing his people for these wars, as you mentioned. Yeah. And um, if you notice that last week we mentioned the opposition that God's people faced initially as they went back to Jerusalem. Yeah. They faced opposition from Sanballat. Yeah. And as you said, I'll call them bad mind people. Yeah. It was trying to prevent Jerusalem from being restored. Yes. But God wanted them to understand that that is only the beginning of the battle. Right. <laughs> they're going to continually face in different era, different struggles that they're going to face. And we're going to use this as an opportunity now to go into some details. Okay. I'm not sure, Ella, if you have the few, first few verses of Daniel chapter 11. Okay, I'll pull it up one now. To three. Okay. Daniel chapter 11 from one to three. If you're a good student of, of Daniel chapter two, seven, eight, and nine, you could pick up on Daniel chapters one to three, Daniel chapter 11, one to three, very easily. So we're yes. going to read that and try to get into some details. So as we just said, as we said, a broader picture, this is about conflict that will affect God's people. Yes. Um, and literally, by the way, if you notice King of the North, King of the South, when King of the North want to attack King of the South, they have to march through Jerusalem. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> literally. <laughs> so people are always anxious to see different army is going through and, and through and wondering when their day is going to come to be attacked. All right. Yes. Let's, so let's bef- before I read the text, I just want to say something here. Yes. Uh, both Pastor Chambers and I use other translations of the scripture and yes. versions. Yes. Uh, I use eight at least besides the original text, right? But when I personally am in Daniel, more time I stick with the King James simply because they're not of, they're not interpretations of scripture in there. Right. It's just the scripture. So I try to stick close when I'm in the book of Daniel to the King James. That's just me. Right. Also, I, beginning at verse one, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings. So remember, I said earlier that there are kings and kingdoms standing up and going down all the time. So three kings will stand up in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. Mm -hmm. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And I'm glad that the text says Grecia. Mm -hmm. Verse three, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Right. 
Wow. Again, I'm going to share <laughs> um, on the screen, <laughs> right? Yes, and, uh, thank you for this. That's good, yes. Right, so basically it says that, behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. God is yes. giving them information ahead of time, better information than CNN. Yes. And the four shall be far richer than him all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. And as you mentioned, I'm happy it says Greece. If you notice, when God named the kingdom, he's trying to give you a marker. Okay, yeah. He's showing you that by that time, Middle Persia will have come in conflict with Greece. And the interpretation of that, based on history, is that the three kings that he's talk about are Cambyses, uh -huh. from 530 to 522, Bardia, 522, Darius first, 522 to 486, and then Xerxes, Mm. 486 to 465, he's the one who raised up um, a stockpile of manpower to fight against the kingdom of Greece. And uh, he will <laughs> lose, yeah, he will how lose, to lose those battles. And then yeah. the other king, that would, the great king that would stand up according to verse 3, is the king Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, you should have known that, that a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with dominion and do according to his will. Another indication that this is Alexander the Great is found in verse 4. And it says, and when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of the yes. but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. So, pardon, the pardon the interruption. Yes, sir. So, so now we're seeing where we get, uh, again, where God begins to open up or give us a macro view at certain points and a more uh, close right. view of right. things he's already talked about. So Alexander shows up in uh, the book of Daniel already, but he's moving swiftly. Yes. Right. He's it, his power is represented as moving swiftly. And now we can see, well, swiftly to do what? What did he conquer? And so forth. So I like that God is taking us back to that movement and giving us some more details here. Correct. Correct. Interpretation of verse four is on the right hand. We are the four generals of Alexander the Great who took over from his kingdom represented by the four um, that divided among the four winds of heaven. And the four mm -hmm. winds going back to Daniel seven and eight represents the four geographical points um, in relation to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And these four generals are Lysimachus, Cassander, Seleucus, and Ptolemy, and you'll notice that eventually focus will divert to Seleucus and Ptolemy, the king of the north and the king of the south. So those are just, that's an example of some details that can be given. I'm not sure if you want to pick up from there, Ella, and give and, and go further with some detail, because the next slide I'm going to share is about the different kings. I'm not going to go into details. I'm showing you now how the kingdoms um, were wrestled from different kings right? Um, and, and how they ruled. You have the Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucus kingdom in Seleucus. And if, what you'll notice is that just like Pharaoh and Caesar, um, Ptolemy and Seleucus and Antiochus are royal names. They are not uh -huh. real names. They are just okay. royal names. So when you say okay. Antiochus Epiphanes, it is just like saying Caesar Augustus. Right. right. Um, and if you notice where Antiochus Epiphanes come, as we mentioned earlier, from 175 to 164 AD. So, so the wars that follows from verse 5 um, down to ver about verse 16 mm -hmm. involve these kings that fought against each other. And, uh, and I'm going to be honest with you, I don't remember some of those details. Yeah, And if, if you wake me up in the morning and ask me to explain <laughs> it to you, I may not be able to explain it to you. Right. But what I know are the different areas where the, where the transitions are made. Right. And more and more, I am reading and understanding history. I'm able to explain because I have to teach Daniel um, so I understand it a little better. But right. the key thing, as I we said earlier, is to understand the where the transitions are made. If you notice right there, by time of 51, we yes. have Cleopatra IV, who is... Um, room. Right. So we start to make that transition. I want to go back to which the, the years that you gave for Epiphanies, right? Because you made a point earlier, it was almost in passing 
uh, about, if I say it wrong, based on what you said, correct me, but it was almost like Antiochus Epiphanes couldn't fit this bill because he didn't live long enough. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. over overstating it, but I mean, there, there's more to it than that. But just that fact alone, mm -hmm. and based on your chart, then we say, wait a minute, there must be something else God is, is trying to say to us mm -hmm. because he couldn't have he couldn't have fit into that space besides the theology of it, but his lifespan just would preclude that straight. Right, right, right. right. Let's yeah. read a few more verses. Um, it says in verse um, five, also, Are you going to go? The, okay, go uh, ahead. The, the king of the south shall be, become strong as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. This represents um, Ptolemy Soter from 323 to 280, king of Egypt, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who was said to be strong, right? He controlled Egypt when it was quite wealthy. Mm -hmm. the, the prince who would come against him would be Seleucid. One, like, maybe I should have, let me put back the, the chart the, back, yes. Chart on the screen so you can um, follow what I'm saying. Uh, one second there, please. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, here it is. Right. So it was now, verse 5 is speaking about Ptolemy 1, Soter, who, who was attacked by Seleucid, Seleucid Nekai, Naki, forgive me about the pronunciation. <laughs> I'm no better, so. Who originally I, uh... <laughs> controlled the eastern part of Alexander's empire but was driven out by a fellow general with the help of Ptolemy, Ptolemy I, mm -hmm. he was able to recover and not only recover this territory, but drive out Lysimachus out of Asia Minor and Syria. So he eventually became fully king of the north. So Seleucus was king of the north. From there on, all of king of the south ruled Egypt, and they are called Ptolemy, differentiated only by a number of names that I mentioned before, their personal names, and king of the north referred to as the Lucid or Antiochus with different, with similar differentiation. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to verse six. We're not going to we're not going to do entire chapter like this. We're just giving you a few examples. <laughs> I have right information on verse six, down to as I said, verse verse thirteen. Yes, and when you're done, we can make the transition to Rome uh, right. when you're done with this. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm just going to give you one more example because I tell you this this deep, these details are they are not very exciting to look into. So I'm I'm just going to give one more example. It says. Verse 6, and at the end of, of some years, they shall join forces for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his author, authority shall stand, but she shall be given up with those who brought her and with him who begot her and with him who strengthened her in those times. Now this sounds very confusing. But as I said, only if you understand the history would you appreciate what is being said here. What what I like this story because it is a big soap opera. True indeed. You don't need <laughs> to watch <laughs> foolishness on TV. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> if you understand the, the history behind it, it's a big soap opera. And, and the Bible is very interesting in mm -hmm. presenting the soap opera between between um the Antiochus and Ptolemy in the 261 to 250. BC. It was a marriage that was supposed to happen, that was supposed to bring, um, let me just explain what it is. It says, around 250 BC, both kings attempted to make peace by allowing Antiochus II, Theos, to marry the daughter of Ptolemy II, Philadelphus. Her daughter was Bernice. Mm -hmm. The problem was that Antiochus already had his other wife called Leodice. Yeah, the deal was that broke, Antiochus would divorce her, which he did, However, the marriage didn't work out. Antiochus found that he didn't like Bernice. He kept <laughs> comparing her to his former wife. Again, nice, so far, right? And so when he, her father, Ptolemy II, died, he put her away and remarried mm -hmm. Leodice. Leodice was suspicious. So once she regained power, she used her authority to have Antiochus, Bernice, and her son killed. That's <sighs> what happened in verse six a big soap opera story 
<laughs> now, let me ask you, Pastor. I, I know part of the answer, I'm sure, but yeah. why is God to, why, like, who cares? Why are we, why is he putting us through this? Why are we reading about these alliances and strange soap opera, if that's a word, ways of these alliances happening, but dismantling? And why does that even matter? Well, you answered it earlier um, because it affects God's people. Okay. And, and God's people will be there. Just like um, today, we are looking at the nations, China, America, mm. Europe, you know, what's happening. God will give us enough detail to, to know, let us know that he's still in charge. Somebody is asking a question about making these signs available to the churches. And um, yes, um, I can make the sign available afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll give it to Ella Harris and he will decide what to do with it. Okay. Very uh, nice. Again, no, so, so verse seven says, but from the from a branch of our roots, one shall arise in his place who shall come with an army into the fortress of the king of the north and deal with them and prevail. The, king, the branch of our roots would be, the, her, her would refer to Laodice. Um, and for, no, sorry, her would refer to Bernice who was, who was killed. Ptolemy the third brother of Bernice decides to avenge his sister's death mm -hmm. by invading Syria. He took his army all the way to Babylon in the east and left his navy occupying Seleucid. And, there, and so for many years, the Egyptians dominated the eastern Mediterranean. So it's given the fact that, verse 7, that, that, that the king of the south controlled um, the area. And it goes on and on and on. I'm, I'm going to let you jump to, to where Rome comes in early because <laughs> a lot of details are running out of, out of time. Yeah, so we can pick up in uh, verse 11, I mean, verse 16, uh, but I'm not going to, I'll read just a little bit of it. Verse 16, yeah. uh, the Bible reads, so it's where Rome and the Prince of the Covenant come into the picture as yes. in the lesson study. Verse 16, but he who comes against him shall do according to his own will and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. So mm -hmm. Pastor Chambers already gave us a pivot point, I called it, earlier, uh, to, to almost to decide where north and south, north of what, south of what. Yeah. Pivot point, enter Jerusalem. So the glorious, the glorious land. land um, Ella, you, what did I say? No, I'm, not, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to oh. ask you to explain the glorious land. Oh, well, it's Jerusalem and it's an area where where ancient Israel has existed. And the new power that takes over in the area is pagan Rome. Now, I know that there's some more about what made it glorious, but the, the point here is now pagan or imperial or the Western Roman Empire, if you want to say, is in the picture. And so if you're if you're making notes from, OK, Daniel two, it's. One, two, three, the fourth down in the image that God showed Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. And this one wasn't identified by saying this is Rome. Yes. By now, God would have established his track record. You know what succeeded, what kingdom succeeded, what, because he gave you in real words. And you're like, okay, well, the next one with these certain characteristics must be, now that we have those characteristics in ancient history on our side, must be pagan or imperial Rome. So now <laughs> pagan Rome shows up, but we see, of course, a lot of details. Do you want to go into those details, sir? Or No, no just, just to say that um, the, the glorious land is attack on the glorious land. I identify him as Rome because in Daniel chapter 8, it, the glorious land was also identified by the little mm -hmm. one attack, the glorious land, which is Jerusalem. And yes. also another, another little detail is the imposition of taxes. Oh, um, yes. 20, yes. Um, should also let us know that this is speaking about Rome. OK, so when that happens now, of course, I'm going to run ahead into Jesus's time. Well, really, yes. we're not running ahead, but in terms of the Bible, right? in the Bible, you're reading the Bible, you're in Daniel and you think all of this is in sort of order, but it's not in the, the King James. It's not. So then you enter Jesus's time and based on the details that we have here and some details we see in the in the Gospels, we see that Rome was in power 
imposition of taxes is, is, is a detail that you can know and you can know what Caesar was in place and so forth at the time. And that helps us again to line up and say, all right, God is giving us some, some real solid historic details so we can know who, what, why, and what impact it has on God's people and his mission overall. Right. And verse 22, it says, with the force of a flood, they shall be, be swept away from before him and be broken. And also the prince of the covenant, another indication, the prince of the covenant is, who, is Jesus. Yeah. So it, again, referring to, um, to, to the to Roman Empire. Yes. So we see that Jesus appears in, you know, in the story multiple different times. Uh, but I think we're running out of time here. Yes. Uh, so, the, yeah, go ahead. Um, the story of, 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 of Rome ends with um, verse 28, mm -hmm. um, thereabout. And then a transition is made from verse 29. Mm -hmm. um, if we read a few verses, we can identify who this guy is. Um, it says, at the appointed time, he shall return and go toward the south, but he shall not be by the former, former or latter, for ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return in rage against the Holy Covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place here the abomination hmm. of desolation. That is the key that identifies this kingdom. And the reason we are saying that this is no papal Rome is that it says in verse 35, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them and purify them and make them white until the time of the end. Ah, it is a, it is papal Rome that ruled the world until the time of the end, 1798, when the Pope was taken captive. Let me ask you a question. It's rhetorical. We already know it's rhetorical. But so and somebody sacrificing a pig has nothing to do with this. <laughs> somebody yes, sacrificing yeah, a pig. Bring us back to that point. That this is one of the reasons why <laughs> the folks interpret it to be Antiochus Epiphanes, because he desecrated the sanctuary. But his desecration of the sanctuary didn't last until the time of the end. Ah, uh, isn't that easy? I mean, honestly, there are a lot of details that could yeah. really trip us up. But 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 this is a, a pivotal one that God just dropped the key right in front of us, and I'm thankful. Right, and from verse 36 to 39, give us a little more details about the activities of this same power that represents the same power of the little horn of Daniel seven and part of the little horn of Daniel eight. It says that he will. Bla speak blasphemies against the God of gods. That again should tell us that this is speaking about the same little horn who blasphemed God yes. in Daniel 7 and Revelation um, chapter 13. And then we're jumping because time is going yes. to verse 40. Yes. Because verse 40 brings us to the end of this conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. This is where and I get excited, by the way. By this, time, by this time, you'll notice that king of north and king of south have changed in terms of what they represent. Ah. From, from, from Rome, um, it, it, it changes. All right, so let's go to verse 40, Ella, over to you. Okay, verse 40 of Daniel 11, scrolling up. I was so listening to you, I didn't scroll up. Okay, at, and at the time of the end, so God is giving us another detail, at the time of the end, and when you're reading it in the King James, you can find that phrase again. This is why I like it if you're an English-speaking person. In the King James, you can find that phrase again and, and have an understanding of when that would be along with history, shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Mm -hmm. Verse 41, he shall enter also into the glorious land. What land is that? Jerusalem. But, but, but we have to understand it a, a different way, but it still yes, represents yes, yes. God's city of peace, God's people, if you want to say, and more. Yeah. And many countries shall be overthrown. And countries is a term that, just, let's just say many shall be overthrown. Mm -hmm. But these shall escape out of his hand, 
even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt and shall not escape. Okay. Uh, I don't know how far you want me to go here. No, that's all right. I can pause here. Well, a, a very important concept in the book of Daniel is time of the end. Yeah. Once the Bible says time of the end is very important, I think, and it, it repeated it as several times. Matter of fact, Daniel's book would be closed up and sealed until, until the time of the end. Yes. And in, it, it's going to be mentioned again in Daniel chapter 12. If you understand the un, time of the end concept, you, you, you're far away in understanding Bible prophecy. One of the things that indicate the beginning of it, the, there are several things that indicate the beginning of the time of the end. One of them, which will be mentioned next week, mm -hmm. when we study Daniel chapter 12, mm -hmm. is the opening up of the book of Daniel. In Revelation chapter 10, the same angel who closed the book opened it back in in in, in the time of the end. Let me say, um, let me let me uh, say again too in Re in Revelation chapter one. Right. When the when it when the book opens, he says it is an opening or an unveiling of the book. And then there are three blessings that come. Yeah. So he said, seal not the vision in the text where you're talking about. But then he also opens it up in Revelation one. Right. So that's good that God is opening up what he sealed up and closed up in Daniel 12. Correct. The time of the end in term, there are some indications um, that the time of the end would, would, would approach in Matthew 24. Those mm -hmm. signs, mm -hmm. if you notice, when, when Jesus made the transition from a time of trouble, such as never was, he says that immediately after the tribulation in those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. Those events indicate that we are now beginning the time of the end. Okay. And for those of you who are, who are new to Bible prophecy, time of the end is, is different from end of time. Right. Time of the end is that period of prophecy referred to in Daniel, where basically once you enter into that time, it is like the last lap of the race. Um, okay. It is. It is. You're on that belt. What do you call that belt? Um, when you when you're in the airport or so you you, you go on the. Oh, it's it's like it's like a conveyor. A conveyor oh, oh, belt. Oh, 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 you mean when you're standing on it? Right. Oh, it's like an escalator that doesn't go up. <laughs> right. So you once you yeah. get on that escalator, it's taking people you right come over. Up. Yeah. <laughs> so once you're in the time of the end, it is it is it means end time is is very near. Yeah. And one of the main indicator of the beginning of the time of the end is the, is when the Pope was taken captive by Napoleon's general. Yeah. Who is actually the king of the south that attacked the king of the north. You really want to start that now, sir? <laughs> All right. All right. Um, mm -hmm. And Napoleon's general took the Pope's captive. And Bible students, Bible scholars in that time recognized this yes. as, as the beginning of the time of the end. And, and they started to study the prophets of Daniel and Revelation. And so that gave rise to the Advent movement, the people, yes. the remnant who was to, who was to preach to everlasting gospel during the time of the end all right so it says at the time of the end this king of the soul shall attack him and the king of the north shall come against him with a whirlwind with chariots horsemen of his many ships and and so on um the, the quarterly takes this view and by the way even within adventist circle there are many different right. views right about this right so we're not going to be setting this as the standard but it's a very very interesting um, situation. If you were alone, let me let me just explain. Mm -hmm. But notice in earlier parts, King of the South represents Egypt. Yes. And in Revelation chapter eleven, the Bible identifies Egypt uh -huh. <laughs> as a place where God's people were crucified. Right. right? Egypt and Sodom. Uh -huh. Egypt represents atheism. And Sodom represents um, immorality, immorality. Secularism, right. Right. So this is a very interesting analogy. I, That's I'm not good. saying I have perfect hold on it. No. The idea is that um, at the time of the end, atheism would attack um, papacy and um, kind of give it a deadly wound. That's interesting. You know? Yes, of course. <laughs> give of it a course. deadly wound. But in the end, the lesson, the lesson agree. That in the end, both of them will come together, both 
papacy and atheism or, and all the other will come together to attack the glorious land to attack um, God's people. And, and in, at this time, the glorious land would not refer to literal Jerusalem. No. We refer, refer to the holy mountain of God. Um, we have a notice in Revelation 14, the children of God are standing on Mount Zion with the lamb who had gotten victory over the mark of the beast and his image and so on. So that um, some of these details, I um, like verse, verse um, 43 to 45, mm -hmm. I'm going to just hold my seat and watch <laughs> how it yeah. unfolds. No, that's I'm good. Gonna speculate as to what they mean. That's good. Maybe you have some other ideas. Elder. Well, let me just say, I'm going to give a principle. I'm not going to open up those verses, but I'm going to give a principle. And this is something that people who despise truth will miss. Okay. Sometimes people state as fact what we are learning. Right, right. You understand? So the in the same way that the people during Daniel's time, and maybe I'm saying it just, I'm grossly overstating it, but during the time of Daniel, as the scripture related to all that God had revealed in those moments were sealed up and those individuals didn't quite understand what was happening, God is revealing and I said, is revealing, is present participle, like he's still revealing. Yes, yes. Understanding yes. of this in Daniel, and I don't know, what are the seven thunders? What is that, right? And, yes. and so there are things that God is still revealing, and I'm not naive enough or proud enough mm -hmm. to, to nail down some of the stuff that God is still revealing. We will have understanding because he put it there, but mm -hmm. some of it we still are wrestling with, and I'm quite fine with it, sir. I'm not upset yes. about it. I, I, and one of the things about these prophecies as we come to a close mm -hmm. is that you'll notice that, and, and the same thing happens in Revelation, that each prophecy reveals more details about each kingdom. Yeah. Transition. In chapter two, more details were given about the feet of iron and clay than any other kingdom. Chapter seven, more details are, are given about each kingdom and more are about, given about the little horn. Mm. Chapter eight, again, little horn. And chapter 11, even further details, and not only more details, but goes further into the last days about what's going to happen. Okay. And I think that, and, and I and I think that there's a strong correlation between verse 44 to 45 and and um Revelation 17. I'm studying it. Um right now I'm in Revelation 17 for the past couple of nights. I've I've gotten up and tried to sit on it and, and look at it. Because those are prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled, and we just have yeah. to. I see what you're. I see where you're going. Yes, I see where you're going. Keep in it, yeah, and um, keep our eyes on, on on what's happening and see how it will be. It will, it will play out. Oh, but in the Lord. end, in the end, Revelation 17 and 18 tells us that Babylon will fall. The the the, 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 the system that opposed God's people, yeah. it is going to come to an end. God's people are going to be victorious. Yeah, I'm coming now. No, I'm going to let you close with your with your nice point that you love. Um, yeah. God's people are going to be victorious because Michael is going to stand up on their behalf. Beautiful. So I'm going to agree with Pastor Chambers here. Uh, what we said with that one of those points in your close there just brought it back to my mind. How we were seeing literal kings of the north and south, if you want to say, that applied in the day that it was referencing. And then we see how God gives us a spiritual principle. Now, likewise, in the way that Babylon, the real empire under one, two, three, one, two, three kings that I can recall. Maybe I'm running too fast, right? After, under three rulers, that fell. That kingdom fell, just like God said it would. And then, of course, the Medo-Persian Empire took over with, at the moment, while Cyrus was still sort of representative of Jesus, mm -hmm. Babylon falls. Uh, spiritually now, we're looking forward to the day when the real Jesus, mm -hmm. the real Jesus, Michael, he stands up after the judgment is set. He finally stands up, having vindicated his character, vindicated the characters of his people who would have uh, finally uh, said yes to God. And that's the last yes. And they would have been firmly established just awaiting the second coming. Babylon has to be spiritual. Babylon has to come down, has to come down.
so that Jerusalem, now we're making spiritual Jerusalem here. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul, this is a text I love, and I'm closing here. Paul says that we are, of, are made of the same material as our mother, holy yes. Jerusalem. So in the yes. way that Adam was created from the dust of the earth, we, uh, because of the second Adam, we receive our assignment to be a part of Jerusalem the same Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven in, in Revelation 21. So Babylon falls, Jerusalem is firmly established, and God's people will finally reign with God. And it, and it gets so good, Pastor, mm -hmm. that God actually changes his address. I won't run ahead, but he changes his ad address. And, and finally, the tabernacle of God will be with humankind, and that will be his home base, not in the heavens far away from his people, but eventually he will, uh, with the new Jerusalem, come down and make a capital here a thousand years after he, Jesus Christ, comes. So I'm looking forward to next week's study. Yes. I won't give you too much here because we have to move. But I'd like to say thank you to you, Pastor Chambers. It's always a pleasure. And I mean that from every part of my little heart here. And uh, for those who are watching, uh, in uh, a moment, we are going to put up the Jamaica Union of Seventh-day Adventists uh, program in progress. You'll see it here on the social media page, Facebook page for the Central Jamaica Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And then at 11 o'clock, while that is happening, we're also going to premiere a church service, an entire church service coming from, and I won't say where, you'll see it pop up at 11 a.m., right on the Facebook page for the CJC. So thank you for the time. And we don't have a, what do you call it? We don't have a little, a little what's your name? Uh, what do you call it again, Pastor, to close us off here? Uh, well, it's a montage. The video thing, montage. The yeah. end montage. We don't have one of say, those. Like, we, we are taking notes. Persons yes. have made comments, requesting yes, their notes and all of that. We, have, we, have, we are taking note of your comments. And um, some persons express appreciation for the study and so they would like Praise to continue Lord. with us. Um, we are learning too. I must, yes. I must be ad admit, don't think we are the expert on it. No, I'm just at a no. different stage of understanding, and That's I'm right. growing every day. I'm reading different ideas, and, and we encourage you to do the same and to grow in your understanding. Because you know, for some people, you know, one of my students said to me, Sir, I thought Bible was easy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I said to her, Listen, the Bible yes. has different levels, yeah, in it, and God wants us, but God wants us to understand, as the Bible says, Daniel says, the wise will understand. Oh, yes. We don't focus on that. <laughs> Beautiful. So I'm going to resist the urge and uh, just say thank you. And uh, Pastor, I'm going to cut the stream. And if you would no just problem. hang back for God one moment. You. Thanks for joining. Yes. All right, everyone. We'll see you again next time.